how would you describe this pulse okay. sequence? Multi-echo. Multi-echo. Can, can I ask you a question? Probably yes. When we do CSF flow studies, are, th are these studies utilizing long Ts? Or it's not a completely different sequence? Okay, the CSF flow studies, which we'll talk about tomorrow, okay, those are using a technique called phase contrast to detect motion. And the TE actually is relatively <laughs> short, but the TE isn't really so much of an issue. Okay? So this is a multi-echo, spin-echo pulse sequence. Two 180-degree RF pulses. We acquire two signals after a single 90-degree RF pulse. And if we place each one of these into its own K-space, and then go out till TR and do this again and again and again. We will fill up for each of these multiple lines of K-space and generate two images of the same slice, each of which has a different contrast, correct? Okay, so let's make a modification here. And that modification is that I am going to turn on the phase encoding gradient again before the second 180-degree RF pulse. When I acquire my first signal after the first 180-degree RF pulse, I will write that into k-space then I'm going to take the second signal that I acquire and I'm going to put it into the same k-space. Does that seem strange? Someone is frowning. What's the problem? Any problem? Then we'll go back and we'll do this again and we'll be able to fill up right, sequential rows, each TR filling up two lines of k-space. And if I then Fourier transform this across and then down, I will generate what? A single image. And how long did it take me to acquire that image? The time is the number of phase encoding steps times the TR, typically. But in this case, we acquired two phase encoding steps for every TR. So I've essentially cut my imaging time in half. OK, what about the contrast? What is it about the contrast that you're having a question about? You have two different T's. Okay. So, <clears throat> if we look at the information that we're placing into K-space, each time we go through this process, we acquire two signals. Each of those signals, first of all, was acquired at a different time following the 90 degree RF pulse. So each of those signals represents a signal acquired at a unique TE. The contrast in each of those signals is different. So if we do this and fill up k-space, half of it with information acquired at a shorter TE and half of it with information acquired at a longer TE, how is that going to affect the appearance of the image? Well, the contrast in this image will look like what? Some composite of these two TEs. What's going to determine whether it looks more like a TE1 image or a TE2 image? Any ideas? T1, did you say? Yeah. 
<laughs> okay. TR? No. My, in other words, the information that we place in here has one of two TEs. When we Fourier transform this, all of that signal is essentially combined and sorted out together. So this image, right, has a TE that is some combination of one and two because there's information in there from both TEs. But remember something, that when we look at the data in K-space, what determines the contrast that we ultimately see in the image? The stuff that fills the center of K-space, right? The periphery of K-space is determining our Resolution. Edge, resolution. edge resolution, exactly. So if you are interested, let's say, in an image that has a TE of 1, then what I would suggest is every time you acquire this signal from TE number 1, write that into the center of K-space. And if you're interested in right, TE number two, each time we acquire those lines, put them into the periphery of K-space. If on the other hand, we just sort of evenly interleave these all the way across, we will simply have an image that has a TE that's somewhere in between the two of them. And the key here is that doing this cuts our imaging time in half. Now these are two successive echoes. But we could actually keep going, right, turn on another 180 degree RF pulse, and then out here, right, sample TE number three. And we could even go beyond that. Every additional echo we acquire means that within a given TR, we are filling that many lines of K-space. And we can further accelerate our imaging. Okay. But the, the center of K-space is also, I, I mean also the middle of the frequency encoding also contributes to the center of K-space. That's okay. true. And those come at every T. Okay. So you're only taking care of, you're not completely removing, you're not, um, you're not purifying it to just one TE, right? If you, well, if you, it will never be, a, it will never be a single TE because even if you put that stuff way out in the periphery, it's still contributing to the image. All we're saying is that what's in the center of K-space will dominate the contrast. Right, but I'm saying all TEs are going to contribute to the center of K-space through the frequency encoding. Is that correct? Well, no. This is the center of K-space, right? right? So this is the time domain. Right. When we acquire, if, if all of the signals that we acquire at the second TE in brown are placed only at the top and the bottom, they will not occupy that center of K-space at all, right? Just because they're way out in the periphery doesn't mean they have no impact on the contrast. It just means that it's dramatically lessened. And now this technique, which is variously called fast spin echo or turbo spin echo imaging, is a way to dramatically accelerate the speed at which you image. Right? A typical number of echoes, which we refer to as the echo train length. So a typical echo train length following our excitation might be as many as 8 or 14 
That's a factor by which you shorten your imaging. It can be even more than that. In fact, you can actually acquire all of the lines of case space following a single excitation like that. And that would be something that we call single shot fast spin echo imaging. Which we'll talk about more in a bit. Yeah? Are we changing the phase gradient uh, at each step before T1 and T2? Or does it well, you might, but let me ask you this. What if we don't? It doesn't really matter because by applying it twice, the signal that we sample over here has been encoded by double the amount of phase encoding. Okay? So exactly how it's worked out in a given pulse sequence is, you know, kind of a, a complicated question that would depend on all kinds of variables and what the programmer had in mind when they designed that pulse sequence. But in principle, you wouldn't have to because the, it's the aggregate amount of phase encoding that's incorporated into this signal, which is two applications of this as opposed to the first signal we sampled, which only had one. You do multi-slice, you would do each slice after, after each, T, uh, each TE. So if we did multi-slice, right, we would have our 90, right? And we'd have a series of 180s. Once all this was done, we would then give a 90 for slice number two. And then acquire our 180s, etc. Okay? So. Let's just look at a couple of things. What is happening, first of all, to the signal during this process? So we start out with some amount of signal transverse magnetization created by this 90 degree RF pulse. It goes away with T2 star. I went too far there. We'll go away with T2 star, I'm sorry. Then at the 180 it will start to rise again. Then it will fall again. The next 180 will knock it back up again, it will fall again, etc. This will be the T2 curve. So we're essentially sampling multiple points on the T2 curve. Now let's do away with this whole multi-slice thing for a second and talk about what determines how many echoes we can acquire after a single excitation like this. You said T, TR. Well, TR is when we repeat this. So if the TR was extremely short, that might be an issue. Okay, the T2 of the tissue, meaning, to put it, I think, a little bit more simply, is just depends on how much signal we have left, right? which of course is a function of the T2. We can keep sampling and applying additional echoes I mean, technically, you could do it as long as you want. But depending on the tissue, at some point in time, there isn't going to be any signal left to sample. All right? So if we want to acquire many echoes to significantly accelerate our imaging, one of the issues is, can we cram them all in in time before the signal is gone. That depends on how rapidly we can do this. And remember that there's a whole bunch of stuff going on. <coughs> Slice select gradients, phase encoding gradients, frequency encoding gradients, sampling during TE. In order to do this,
in a sufficient time, we need to space all of this stuff very closely together. Okay? And that depends on how rapidly we can turn our gradients on and off. how rapidly we can sample the signal. This is one of those applications where having a high bandwidth receiver, one that can sample very rapidly and therefore accomplish all of our sampling in a shorter period of time will make a huge difference. Without a high bandwidth receiver, without very high performance gradients, you'll have limitations in the number of echoes that you can acquire. Or if it's not actually a limitation in terms of the number of echoes, it might be a limitation in the signal to noise of your image because some of your later echoes will be acquired when there isn't much signal left. And this parameter, which is something that the vendor should be able to quote you, is called the echo spacing. And when you look at the specs of an MR system, one of the performance criteria, so to speak, is what is the minimum echo spacing. How close together can you cram all of these 180 degree RF pulses, signal sampling, one after the other. If we talk about reconstructing an image from one of these multi-echo acquisitions, Since contrast is dependent on the center of K-space, typically the signals that are acquired earlier on in this echo train will be the ones that we will place into the center of K-space. Okay? And the ones that are acquired later in the echo train will be the ones that we will place in the periphery of K-space. As a result, Let's say we're going to give our 90 degree RF pulse and acquire three echoes. So we might write them in these three lines. When we go back around for the next TR to do this again, we will then be filling in this manner. So not necessarily, in other words, filling K-space from top to bottom in order. Because in order for us to maximize right, the yield of all these echoes, we want to place them in the right locations in K-space with the highest amplitudes in the center and the lower amplitudes at the periphery. Another thing to be aware of is that if you're acquiring many, many echoes, and sampling way out on this T2 curve where there isn't much signal left, then the stuff that you place in the periphery of K-space may actually have extremely low signal amplitude. So low that it's, you know, close to noise. What happens to your image in that case? Okay, correct, sort of, okay? When you say spatial resolution, you actually mean the number of pixels in the image. So since we have however many lines of K-space we have, that's how many pixels will be in our image. So our image will still be whatever it is, a 256 by 256 image. But you're absolutely correct that since there is such low amplitude out here in the periphery, that area which is giving us our ability to define edges in the image, the sort of sharpness and crispness of edges in the image will be missing and we can get significant blurring in the image if the amplitude in, this farth in these farthest out echoes is too low. Okay. Any questions about this so far? All right, I just want to point out one other approach. So you guys have seen things like uh, MRCP, MR cholangiograms, yes, MR urograms, 
milligrams, you've seen these types of things. So these are images where the goal is to image fluid. And all we really care about is the contrast between fluid and everything else. Technically these are actually considered low contrast images. We don't have any sort of fine ability to differentiate different types of subtle gradations of contrast. All we see is this stark difference between fluid and everything else. Whether it's in the bile duct or in the you know, urinary system, whatever it happens to be. So in those cases, we don't really need a lot of high contrast information. And on the other hand, we're very interested in edge definition. So in utilizing a fast spin echo acquisition, where we might have a 90 and then a long series of 180 degree RF pulses, we want to generate an image that is heavily T2 weighted, has a very long TE, and gives us this contrast between fluid and everything else, yet maintains very sharp edge definition. Well, if we would take this approach and then simply place our information in K space from the center out, what would happen? Well, we would have our contrast because we have signal amplitude in the center, but these are already being done at very long TEs. When you get out to these latest echoes, there really isn't that much signal. And there can be a very significant amount of blurring out in the periphery, which if you want to define right, the border of the bile duct or nerve root or whatever it happens to be is going to be problematic. So there are approaches where to get around this, we actually invert the ordering of the data in K-space and put the highest amplitude echoes in the periphery and the lowest amplitude echoes in the center. What does that mean? That means that these images will have relatively poor contrast resolution, which is really just fine because we're not interested in that type of contrast resolution. Right? We don't care whether you can tell the difference between you know, liver or kidney, cortex or medulla or whatever. We just want to know the difference between fluid and everything else. And we preserve the higher signal amplitude for the periphery of K-space so that we get very good quality edge resolution. So doing all these kinds of things is really all about understanding right, the way the information is distributed in K-space and how you can manipulate that to generate the type of image you're looking at. When we talk about the TE of any of these images, you can see it's really not accurate to say that this image has any particular TE. Now we typically talk about something called the TE effective, which is a function of what? The scanner will spit it out. On the, on the image it will be printed over there, TE effective, or it might actually say TE, which isn't accurate. Exactly. The contrast will be dominated by whatever goes in the center of K-space. So whichever echoes you place in the center of K-space, that dominates your contrast. That becomes the TE effective. Effective because this image will always be a composite of many different TEs. Okay. Are those yes. the only two parameters within K-space that we can manipulate, the contrast and uh, edge resolution? Or is As there other information, no, just wondering, there, is there other information embedded in there that we can manipulate? Is there other information embedded in there which you can manipulate? Um, I'm not sure exactly what you're getting at, but but basically this distribution of the distribution of how the data is located in K-space affects those two different properties of the image. There are no other properties that we can work with in there? I'm just, I'm, I'm on a, 
on a more subtle level, are there other manipulations that you can do besides affecting those two properties? Well, the only thing that you can actually do to the data, other than, I mean, there are a whole bunch of things that can be done to the data in terms of filtering it, in terms of, you know, we talked about a quadrature coil having a real and imaginary channel. You can do all kinds of things, like compute the phase as opposed to the magnitude of the signal. Right? You can filter the data. There are all sorts of manipulations that can be done. You can do things like motion correction in case space. But in terms of adjusting the appearance of the image, right, the only tool that we're really dealing with right now is our ability to move data around in case space. Which remember you can do because every single piece of information here contains the same signal from the entire image. And in locating the data, that's what you're balancing out is the contrast information in the image as opposed to edge resolution in the image. So I don't I didn't mean to evade your question, but that's yes. Why does it matter if you like if you change it around, you're gonna still put it to the Fourier transform. Right. It's still gonna deduce the underlying sign functions based Okay, on that's the true. So why does it matter how you have that is, that's the nature, right? That's the nature of K-space. The nature of K-space is that the central components contribute the most information to the contrast in the image. And the periphery contribute the most information to the edge resolution in the image. That's, that's, that's the nature of K-space. Okay. All right. Any other questions? Okay. Let's look at something that is similar to this. Okay, so we've talked about being able to apply our 90 degree RF pulse and acquire multiple echoes after a series of 180 degree RF pulses. Okay. And that's what we're calling fast spin echo imaging. 